Let me invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. And as you're turning to Genesis chapter 5, I want to read just a verse or two from Hebrews chapter 11. Just turn to Genesis chapter 5 and just to give you a little um, background to this. this. Of course, Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Fame of the Faithful. It says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken up, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith is it impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, Genesis 5. It's a long list of names, and then in the middle of this list of names is verse 22. And let's look now at verse 22 through 24. In this list, it says, Enoch walked with God, and he fathered Methuselah uh, 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not because God took him. Keep your Bibles open before you. This is God's Word. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. Lord, we thank you for what it reveals to us. We pray that we would better understand what is before us this morning, and most of all, that we would live our lives in light of what is before us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When Sam said, I think I'll go to church this morning with you, what Sam said startled his wife, Sally. Seven years of marriage, zero interest by Sam in spiritual things whatsoever. After all, if you ask Sam, he'll tell you that making money and business success was the reason for his living. En route to church, Question is just raced through Sally's mind. How will the members receive Sam? Will they be nice? Will they be friendly? Will Sam like the music? The scripture? Will, will Sam like the sermon? A couple enters church. Sally grabs a bulletin, opens the bulletin, and her heart sinks. The scripture reading was Genesis 5. A long list of ancient names from an antediluvian time. Even that sounds boring, doesn't it? Adam, Seth, Enos, Kenan, Mahalia, Jared, on and on, world without end, amen, amen. It was like reading a phone book. Rats, she said. What Sally did not see, however, was this. This Old Testament reading from Genesis 5 was by God's appointment for God's purposes. Sally's fears did not straitjacket the work of the Holy Spirit. Sam sat through the service. He was actually on the edge of his seat, paying attention. And three weeks later, Sam professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When Sally asked Sam, what in the service God used to bring him to faith, Sam said, that's easy. It was the scripture reading from Genesis 5. He said what happened was there's this one phrase that kept repeating over and over like a flashing yellow light at least seven times, I believe. I couldn't get it out of my head. Kept saying, so-and-so lived X number of years, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Sally, I got to thinking, everybody, including myself, is marching toward death. And one day my list will be, my name will be on that list in Genesis 5. It'll be said about me, Sam, and he died. 
I got to thinking about death. I got to thinking about what happens after death, and I knew I needed a Savior. You see, the reality of death found in Genesis 5 was a cold slap of reality, a shot of double espresso coffee, a can of Red Bull for this man. But I want you to know, there is an exception to, and he died, here in Genesis 5. And that is, there is one man who never tasted death. His name is Enoch. Enoch was, of course, as every person since Genesis 3, since Adam, was a sinner. But even while living in a world much like our world, a world that is passing away, a world that is dying, this man, Enoch, displayed a dynamic faith. A faith that makes Enoch a shiny trophy on display for us to see in the trophy case of the Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame of the Faithful. And there is a message from Enoch to us this morning from Scripture. And the message is this. Because God wants us to live out a dynamic faith in a dying world, God tells us how to live a dynamic faith. How do you live a dynamic faith, especially in a world that is dying, a world that is broken, a world that is truly messed up? These verses reveal two characteristics of a dynamic faith, two characteristics that need to be true of your faith and my faith. And the first dynamic is this. People with a dynamic faith believe God. People with a dynamic faith believe God. You notice in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Now, as you think about this concept of belief, uh, we realize how much of our life really is bound up in believing something. Believing something, then acting on what we believe for our own good. Think about advertising. Believe what the advertisement is saying, and good things will happen in your life. Online ad. If you believe what these advertisers say, this spaghetti will give you 30% more fiber, and you'll be healthier. This car will give you great gas mileage, and you'll save money on that liquid gold known as gasoline. These headphones will make the music you listen to sound great, and you'll enjoy the music so much more. This smartphone, oh, it's the bee's knees when it comes to staying connected with all your friends. You see, believe, buy, be rewarded. In politics, you hear it all the time. Believe me, vote for me, and I'll make your life better. Same for medicine. Have you noticed commercials for medicine that they show someone benefiting from what the medicine being advertised is doing? And then you hear this voiceover. And it says, side effects may include nausea, headaches, dizziness, confusion, high fever, profuse sweating, heart attack, seizures, paralysis, and death. <laughs> if you experience any of these symptoms, contact your doctor. Well, if you're dead, I don't think you'd be contacting anyone. Then entertainment. You see only one movie this summer. Go see Top Gun. Go see Elvis. It's a great movie. Go see it. You'll benefit. That, that's the message. Believe. And there's benefits. Friends, because we do this belief thing all the time, belief should not be that much of a stretch for us. But you see, unlike advertisers and politicians and people in every field of life trying to sell you happiness and meaning and identity and significance and security, there's only one person who has ever lived a 100% perfect life, has a 100% perfect track record, who delivers on every promise he makes. Only one person always delivers, and that person is the Lord God. So we believe God. 
We believe God's word. How sad is it that a recent poll came out and said only 20% of people in America now believe that the Bible is God's word? How sad is that? Especially when the God's word is our ultimate authority. I want to give you five key questions that God's word answers with crystal clear clarity. Five questions that everybody has an answer for, but only God's word has the right answer. First question is this. What is ultimate? That is, what is the ultimate reality in our lives? Did it all start with a big bang? Or is there something more ultimate than what we see? Second question, who am I? That is, what is my real identity? Identity is a big thing nowadays. You even have identity politics. Who am I? What's my identity? What is ultimate? Who am I? Three, what's wrong with me? And what's wrong with this world? We know something's wrong. All you have to do is look around, read the headlines. Just look. Something's desperately wrong with this world. What's wrong with this world? That's the third question. Fourth question is this. How can what is wrong be made right? How can what is wrong be made right. Everybody has a solution, don't they? And then fifth, so important, is there any hope for the future? Are we careening to destruction? Catastrophe. Now those are the big issues. Everybody you meet, everywhere, has an opinion about those five big issues. But when it comes to who we believe, we only believe God as he speaks to us through his word about these issues. God answers these issues. All you have to do is listen. What's ultimate? God is. God is ultimate. How about you and me? We're not ultimate, but we are image bearers of God. That's our identity, image bearers of God. And if you're a Christian, another thing that you are, you are in Christ. What's wrong with the world? Simple enough, three-letter word, sin. That's what's wrong with the world. How can what is wrong be made right? Well, the only hope we have to solve our problems is the grace of God in Christ. That's the only thing that's going to change this world, is conversion and revival, the grace of God in Christ. And then, is there hope for the future? Oh my goodness, we have a fantastic future, if we're in Christ. You see, that's what we believe. Those are the five biggies. God answers that, and because we believe, we benefit more than any unbeliever on the face of this earth. We have hope. We have joy. We should have a smile on our face, a twinkle in our eyes. Now, you may want to look at it this way. Let's just boil down this thing of belief in this way. At the end of the day, you believe one of three people. You either believe yourself, you believe others, or you believe God. It's that simple. Ultimately, you either believe yourself, you believe others, or you believe God. So I ask you, ultimately, who are you counting on to reward you? Who is going to reward you? Well, people with a dynamic faith believe God. That's how we operate. And that's the first characteristic of someone with a dynamic faith. Notice in the second place, the second characteristic of someone with a dynamic faith is this. People with dynamic faith walk with God. That's the second characteristic. People with a dynamic faith walk with God. Now I want you to notice something here in Genesis 5. It says in verse 21, before we started reading, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Think about this for a moment. For the first 65 years of his life, Enoch did not walk with God. 
It was after the birth of his children that Enoch began to walk with God. You know, there's an old saying you've heard, and it's not true. Ask any animal trainer. The saying is you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's not true. You can. But there's something else also. Guess what? You're not a dog. You're an image bearer of God. So we should never say that anyone is beyond the reach of God's grace, no matter how old they are. Now we can only speculate about what God's providence used to turn Enoch around. It may have been the birth of his children. You know, new parents are often more open to the Lord when they're holding that new baby. Suddenly it dawns upon the parents, you know, this baby's not just a body. This baby has a soul. Body needs to be nourished, and so does this baby's soul. But we do know that somewhere along the way, Enoch heard from the Lord, because Romans 10, 7 is real clear. Faith comes from hearing a word from the Lord. Genesis 5 doesn't tell us how it happens, but God spoke to Enoch. Enoch responded to God at age 65. Friends, if there's someone you know who's not a Christian, and I know there's people you know who aren't Christians, don't stop sharing the gospel with them. Don't stop praying for them. As long as that person has a pulse, there's hope. Now this interesting phrase here, verse 24, Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? And more importantly, how do we walk with God? Well, friends, it's simple, but it's not easy. But walking with God demonstrates to a dying world a dynamic faith. So how do we do it? Well, there's a clue over, jot this verse down, and I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. Just jot it down in your notes. There's a clue about walking with God from the prophecy of Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And it says, how can two walk together except they have a... And then there's this Hebrew word that can be translated two ways. And both ways apply to us. How can two people walk together unless they have an appointment? How can two people walk together unless they have an agreement? Let's think about this. If you're going to walk with God, which is what's required if you're going to have a dynamic faith... You need to have an appointment with God. You know, in our experience, if you are literally going to walk with someone, you call them, you text them, and you say, Hey, would you meet me at 7.30 this morning, or 7.30 tonight at Winter's Park Circle in Flowood? Maybe in front of the YMCA on the walking track behind the hospital in Brandon. And we'll walk together. You see, to walk with someone else, you need to make an appointment with that person. You can't Skype or FaceTime a walk with someone. Same way with God. God is personal. To walk with someone, you need to make a daily appointment with God. You need to have a time to meet with God. And during this appointment, there's a conversation going on. And here's how it works. God speaks to you through His Word. See, every time you open the Bible, God is speaking to you. I remember asking someone at a Presbyterian exam, a preacher said, do you believe God still speaks today? He says, absolutely, He speaks to me every day. All the preachers went, huh? He says, yes, He speaks to me every day, several times a day, every time I open this Word. I hear the voice of God speaking to me. The Bible is God's voice speaking to you just as directly as if God were sitting across the table talking to you. And then you speak back to God. You know what it's called? It's called prayer. See, this conversation is a dialogue. God speaks to you. You speak back to God. Bible reading, prayer. That's the appointment. Now, you may be asking the question, when's a good time for this appointment? Well, any time is a good time to meet with God. There's no such thing as a bad time to meet with God. He'll never say, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. 
No, you can meet with him any time, but we do find out in Scripture there are sometimes more beneficial to us than other times. See, the Bible gives us descriptions of appointments with God, and please keep in mind, now this, in the Bible, not every description is a prescription, but it seems that the evidence from the Bible points to the fact that the best time to meet with God is in the morning. In the Gospels, Jesus rose early in the morning for his appointment with his heavenly Father. You can see that in Mark 1.35, Luke 4.42. And as usual, science is caught up with what the Bible says. Brain science seems to confirm what we all know intuitively. In the morning, we're fresh, rested, our minds are more receptive to input. In the morning, your mind is like freshly poured concrete, ready to be impressed. In radio, I used to work in radio, there's a saying that said, morning drive time is prime time. And here's why. The music and commercials you hear on your way to work are going to stick in your mind longer than anything else you hear. How many of you have driven somewhere and this song is playing on the radio? What song plays in your head the rest of the day? It's the last song you heard on the radio. Seems like morning is the best time, but look, bottom line is this. People who walk with God have an appointment with God. A daily dialogue, Bible reading, prayer, prayer, Bible reading. So, to walk with God, have an appointment with God. But secondly, notice that if you're going to walk with God, not only do you need to have an appointment with God, but you need to be in agreement with God. That's the second part of walking with God. You need to be in agreement. Now, let's go back to the walking track. Let's say you meet with someone, but you disagree on the direction of your walk. I want to go this way. No, I want to go this way. Well, you're not walking with that person. You're just arguing. I saw a man who years ago went into business partnership with another man. He said, he said, the problem was we were going in two different directions. We were disagreeing on everything about the purpose and goals and how to do the business, so we broke it off. You know, a husband and wife disagree on everything. You know, there's no joy in that journey. To walk with someone, it's good to be headed in the same direction. The same goes for walking with God. To walk with God, you need some agreements in some key areas of life. And the core agreement is this. You need to agree that apart from the gospel, you have no relationship with God. None at all. The gospel is the first step of your journey of faith. And the next, and the next, and the next. As many people have said correctly, you never get away from the gospel. Never. See, we need Jesus' death in our place as our substitute bearing the punishment for our sin. We need Jesus enabling us by the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is pleasing to God. And apart from faith in Christ, apart from dependence upon Jesus, we're not walking through life in faith. We're not even limping on the path of faith. One other agreement is this. We need to agree with God on what he says. What he tells us, when we disagree, if you disagree with anything in this book, guess who's wrong? It's not God. When I disagree with this book, I'm wrong. When you disagree with this book, you're wrong. It's not that complicated. No rocket science there. If someone tells you they're walking with God, and they're living in an immoral relationship with someone else, they can say they're walking with God, but they're blowing smoke. God's Word says, go this way, you go this way. You tell me, how's that walking with God? Now, to be sure, no one walks this path perfectly. Everyone, including me, steps off this path. 
a lot. But if your lifestyle, if the pattern of your life is always this way between you and God, you got a problem. But the good news is this, when you repent, when you change direction, when you trust in Christ, when you walk with God, at least you're heading in the right direction. Yes, it may be three steps forward and two steps back, but that's still progress. You're walking this way, you're walking with God. Speaking of direction, you know, the thing about a road, the thing about a path is, is ultimately, where does the path take you? Where does the road take you? You know, the destiny determines if you're on the right road. If I'm heading north on Highway 49, guess what? I'm never going to end up in Hattiesburg. If I head east on I-20, I'm never going to end up in, in Vicksburg. The direction determines the destination. You know, there's two people in the Bible who never tasted death. Elijah and Enoch. One day at the very tender young age of 365 years old, God just took Enoch from this earth into heaven. How encouraging. If you're walking with God, if we happen to be here when the Lord returns, and we could, we could be alive when the Lord returns. If we're here when the Lord returns to judge the living and the dead in the world, we'll never see death either. But even if we die before the Lord returns, if we're walking with the Lord, guess what? Death will be for us like this. Death will be like going to sleep and waking up in another place. Except that place is in the presence of the Lord. Going to sleep, waking up with the Lord. How wonderful would that be? Either way, whether the Lord returns or he, he tarries. When you walk the path of faith, when you trust and obey, you end up in a good place. And he died. And he died. And he died. Sally's husband, Sam, was right. One day our life's journey will end. But where? Where will your journey end? Well, it depends. It depends on the path you take. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this testimony of a man with a dynamic faith who believed God above himself and above what other people said and believed that God rewards those who seek him. Lord, we pray that we would walk with God. It's not that complicated. We just need to meet with you. We need to have an appointment with you, and we need to, to walk and live in agreement with you. Lord, we do not know your timetable. We do not know if your son, Jesus Christ, will, will come to this earth uh, before we die or if we'll die first. But we do know this, death or not, if we walk with you, we will be with you for eternity. Help us to believe. Help us to believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to walk that path of belief. Lord, help us to live dynamically in this dying world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn of Response is the last verse and the chorus of Trust and Obey. Let us stand and sing together. <laughs>